All right, so welcome to the classical Greek philosophy. And this time, it's the three people that are most important to Greek philosophy. In fact, you could probably say that everyone that you study until now, Thales, an examiner, an examiner, those people are all leading up to these three people. You can discard everything you learned. You don't even have to watch any of the lessons until, unless you watch this three. And then at that point, you'll probably get every Greek philosophy without missing anything. So without further ado, let's get started on it. So the most famous person here would be Socrates. Socrates, there's not a lot much, much known about Socrates. He lived around 500 BCE. And the thing about him is that he didn't have too much dialogues and texts about him. He never wrote any books and no letters or any contemporaries of his writings survives. So all we know from him is from writings in Plato. The best thing we know about him is the five dialogues, which is five different stories that have been written about Plato about Socrates. So obviously, the problem with Socrates is that it's impossible to get a completely objective and correct measure of him. <clears throat> that is, Socrates changes a bit throughout the writings of Plato. And Socrates is attributed to other writings, so Plato's the one that describes them the best. But it's not we're not sure, historians and philosophers alike aren't sure whether Socrates is actually the character depicted in Plato. If we take what Plato said in his writings, he defends several ideas that are obvious that they belong to other philosophers and Plato in general, <clears throat> Plato in specific. But the problem is that we don't know. We can't ever verify his claims. In fact, some people even claim that Socrates don't, e don't even exist. There's too much evidence to say Socrates don't exist by looking at the works of Plato and other playwrights and writers that attribute him at this time. But you could say that Socrates is a highly controversial and not very well-known person. Well, not correctly attributed in any case. So according to Plato, in Plato's model, Socrates is the absolutely perfect philosopher. He doesn't mind the cold, the heat, the feet, whatever. When he went into the military at one point in, in winter, what he did was em when every soldier wrapped it in clothes and fur boots and whatever and went outside, he went outside with his normal clothing that he wears all season, a toga, light sandals, and he didn't even mind the cold or the pain. So for Plato, if, Plato's, if what Plato says is correct, and Socrates was the absolute stoic, he didn't need to care about emotions or desires or any other things because he was so philosophical. Socrates' main idea is that he knows nothing. That was the main point of his always dialogues. He never actually argued for something. All he did was that <clears throat> if he ever argued for something, he said, this idea is held by certain people. And he said, and other people contested that. So he's like, okay, then I will defend those ideas. He never said those ideas were his. His only idea of his own is that he knows nothing. And at this point, <clears throat> it's better to men mention what techniques he used for philosophy. He used the tech dialogue called Socratic method, which is he continues questioning someone unless you get something. Here's a brief excerpt from him and a general. He once asked the general of the Athenian army, said, what do you think is bravery? The general said, bravery is not retreating in battle. And Socrates said, is it always not retreating? What if there's a tactic? And the general says, no, retreating is always quality. And then Socrates gave an example when the army pretended to retreat, but then defeated them at in front of a river, and gen the general couldn't deny that that was courage. So like this, Socrates tries to understand the world, and at this point, he portrays himself as a student and asks questions that eventually contradict their own statements. The evaluation of Socrates is a tough one because, again, we don't know what's really true about Plato, what Plato said about Socrates, but we do know that he is a truly good, great philosopher, if not an excellent one, he would have been evaluated better if some of his ideas weren't too much clouded by Plato's or other people's writings, but he is a good Plato nevertheless. So according to Plato, his major pupil, the person that influenced Greek philosophy the next in 400 BC is Plato. <laughs> Plato is the single most influential philosopher in the history of Western philosophy. Friedrich Nietzsche even stated that Western philosophy didn't even begin to start until Plato existed. Plato is that famous, and unlike Socrates, there's a lot of books that Plato wrote that attributed to him. Well, the most famous thing about him is about the utopia. He described an ideal state <clears throat> when everyone, everything was perfect. In here, basically, he divided them into three categories, the kings, the warriors, and the common peasants. And he said that most people stay in those classes and they don't work until they go up. He writes in this book, The Republic, and he writes that philosopher kings should be philosophers and that they should be philosophy kings
because the people who governs everyone else should be able to know knowledge. At that point, that should only be a philosopher. <clears throat> he has uh, interesting theories. The second most famous one after his idea of utopia is the theory of ideas and forms. This argument is novel in that it's truly logical, metaphysical, and slightly religious at the same time. So Plato wonders, what is a philosopher? How does philosophers work? And he says, philosopher is a pursuer of knowledge. But what's knowledge? Well, and then he goes on to say, well, knowledge can't possibly exist in this world because everything is a measure of something and everything else. If, for example, if your statue is beautiful, it's also ugly in the first place. You can't really know if it's beautiful or ugly. At the same time, numbers, right? We can have the number three or f number three, but that's both small and big. It's smaller than five, but it's bigger than two, right? So at, at this point, he, he thinks that there's another world called the world of ideals. And he says that in this world, these are the true concepts that people search for all his life. In this world, there will be a perfect circle in geometry. There will be the perfect bravery, perfect morals, perfect everything. And everything here are simply just shadows of what are reflected in the world of ideals. And he goes on to state that only people that could see the world of ideas and forms are philosophers. And this relates back to his idea of utopia, why philosophers should rule. He also talked about the immortality. He thought that souls were reborn and born every time and that they didn't change at all. This, reflect, this is reflected in Socratic dialogues, although it was probably influenced by Plato. He has interesting cosmogony, that is the study of stars and stuff, by stating that stars are absolute perfect orbs. Not absolutely absolute, but they're the most perfect ones that we could get. We know now that this isn't true, but you have to look at the significance that stars and those constellations held for an ancient people. He also said that knowledge and perception of this world is not ideal. Of course, since everything here is fake, we can only know about emotions and feelings and deterrences in this world. And he said that knowledge and perception can only, be, true knowledge can only be gained by studying in the world of ideals. That anything here was fake, it's shadows, it's not the world of ideals. And just replicas of this true thing. And he said, a true philosopher must pursue knowledge in that world of ideals. And at this point, he had a pupil named, a very interesting philosopher named Aristotle. The thing about Aristotle is that we could view him in two ways. One way is to see how Aristotle basically screwed up science and technological development for the next uh, 2,000 years or so. But another view is that Aristotle is a truly great person. His ideas are not really unique in the ancient world. That is, there's lots of people who had different ideas, different ideas and forms and theories about stuff. Aristotle was just one of the people. It's just that the church, Catholic church in the 6th to 12th century took his word at everything and that deterred the sciences a bit. So when you look at Aristotle, you can't really say that he screwed up sciences, but that he only met, he came up with ideas that other people mistook. So Aristotle deal, dealt with almost everything. For metaphysics, he rejected the world of ideas as saying, we can't know about it. So we have to focus on the things we know here. And he said, the world of ideals... He, he claims that they don't exist, but his main argument was that everything here is different, and that's why things exist. For ethics, he writes a book called Nicomethean Ethics, and in this way, he states that ethics are, it's, it's quite interesting because they're not the same as Christian ethics or Nietzschean hero ethics, which we'll cover a lot later on. But he says that he uses the idea of the golden mean by saying every moral action must be moderation between two actions. It can't be sadness or happiness was something in the middle and moderation that was always the right thing for politics he didn't believe in philosopher kings he built that everyone had his own purpose and that purpose was to fit into society his logic is it was interesting it's highly controversial because for Arist according to plato things exist in the ideal world so when you say socrates is a man we're referring to man as something ideal and socrates as an example and then we could drive things from it but for aristotle since this doesn't exist what he had to do was that he had to fit in other topics and subjects and logic that's really complicated but basically he tried to make them each fit into one another so basically you could say the first scientific thinking this isn't really logical in today's society but it has some gravity in this world and his most famous achievement is one of physics. He identified five causes, but you need to only focus on two. He said the purpose, the telos of why things happen, and the final result of why, a final result 
of why things happen. So when you say why and purpose of what it happens, there's two things you mean. First of all, why did this happen? What's the purpose behind it? Is there a universal purpose? And second thing, how did how does this thing come to be? What you have to learn from Aristotle is that modern science can only answer the second question, that how things came to be. How were you born? Well, my parents made me, right? But philosophers, as we are, we have to cover the deeper aspect. How do we exist? Why do we exist? What do we have a purpose for existing? And that is the goal of philosophers in the modern society. And Aristotle established this goal, but then unfortunately, the Hellenistic era of philosophy, which is Alexander's reign, came right afterwards, and then that was basically reincarnation of everything. We're going to cover that slightly later. And then philosophy was dead until the Catholic Church revived it, and that was a screwed up version in which they only took Aristotle's word. So Aristotle came at an inopportune time. You have to appreciate his metaphysics, politics, logic, and physics, but he is dealing misrepresented.